rumors of this float around. The newspapers are saying, you know, we understand there's some big deal coming here, um, but it's not public. And while this is sitting in his desk, other things happen which make people doubt Lincoln's commitment to emancipation. One is, and I talk about this in my book, Lincoln's meeting in August with a delegation of black figures from Washington, D.C., ministers mostly, from Washington, D.C. Lincoln, by the way, is the first president to meet with African Americans in the White House as people that are not slaves. I've talked about this. He, he doesn't seem to have this hatred of visceral racism that makes it impossible for him to sit down and talk. But, and he meets with a lot. But in this case, the purpose of this meeting is to persuade them to go out and support colonization. You and we are different races. He, well, first he says, your race is suffering the greatest wrong ever suffered by any people. That's pretty strong. Slavery is the greatest wrong ever suffered by any people. But, he goes on, there is a prejudice against you, which means you can never achieve equality in this country. Even when you cease to be slaves, you are far removed from being placed on an equality with the white race. It is better for us both to be separated. And he tells them there's this area in Central America called Cherokee, it's, where, it's in current Panama, it was Colombia back then, with coal mines and land and all sorts of things. And the United States government knows people who have leases on the land and he can settle people down there and then they will really be able to enjoy all the rights which they will never achieve in the United States. But African Americans basically reject this. They all say, no, absolutely not. Frederick Douglass is furious at this point. He writes a bitter editorial denouncing Lincoln. Um, most blacks have no interest in emigrating out of the United States. Some do, most don't. They insist they are Americans and they have as much right to be here as Lincoln does and they want their rights in this country. So Lincoln's plan is falls apart at both ends, you might say. The border states reject his plan of gradual emancipation. Blacks reject his plan of colonization. That there, there's, you need a new plan, let's say. August also saw, and this is a very famous thing, of course, and it's in Janap's book, the Prayer of 20 Million, this, this editorial that Horace Greeley writes in the New York Tribune, the Prayer of 20 Million, i.e. the population of the North, calling for general emancipation. And Lincoln writes his famous letter in response to Greeley, often quoted, where he says, my paramount object is to save the Union, and it is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I can save the Union without freeing any slave, I will do that. If I, uh, if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union. Then he goes on to say, this is my view of my official duty. I intend no modification of my often expressed personal wish that all men uh, everywhere can be free. This is probably the most frequently quoted and misunderstood, in a way, sentence of Lincoln. If I could free some, I would. If I have to free all, I will. If I, can't, if I could save the Union with any. In other words, Lincoln, to Lincoln, the Union was more important than ending slavery. The problem with that is, if union was the only motivation for Lincoln, he could have saved everybody a lot of trouble by just giving in to the South in the secession crisis. It, is very, it would have been very easy to save the union by accepting the demands of the South, right? If you didn't, that's what Stephen A. Douglas said. If you, if you don't care about slavery, what is the problem here? Why have a war? to save the Union when you could equally save the Union by just telling him, okay, cool, whatever you want, you can have about slavery. Lincoln was not willing to do that. Remember, he was not willing to compromise in the secession crisis. Lincoln said once before the war, we must save the Union, but it must be a Union worth saving. So I think this dichotomy between Union and emancipation is, should not be taken as a, you know, a, a clear either or. It is true, though, I think, it is fair to say that Lincoln did not choose any policy, even emancipation, solely, or maybe even primarily, 
because of its impact on African American people. He chose emancipation partly because he thought it was right and partly because he thought it was the way to win the war. So it is not that Lincoln was a total moralist in office, no. But I think the, no, the idea that this is the one statement of Lincoln's unchanging views is also, I think, wrong. And remember, Lincoln had the preliminary emancipation in his desk while he wrote this letter to Greeley, ready to issue it. So in some ways, this letter is meant to assure more conservative people that when emancipation comes, it's because of the need to save the Union. Lincoln knew that the radicals would be happy, even though they didn't like this letter. When he issued his proclamation, they would think it was great, so they did. So anyway, he had to wait for a victory, though, and that was a ways coming, a while coming. Um, in the summer of 1862, um, the Union Army continues to suffer reverses. First, there's the Second Battle of Bull Run here at Manassas, August 30th, where McClellan had been relieved from command and, um, uh, and the Union Army in charge was now uh, General Pope, who came down, marched down, and at Manassas again he met Robert E. Lee and again was defeated. The Union Army is again defeated by Lee with Stonewall Jackson as Lee's right-hand man there at the Second Battle of Bull Run. And um, uh, somehow, somehow, Lee managed to divide his smaller army and defeat the larger army of Pope. It's a little unclear how he managed to do that, but he forced, he sent Stonewall Jackson around the side, the flank of of Pope's army and led it to retreat and, and um, you know, pushed, pushed him back. A, a, a smaller army divided in two defeated the Union army. This led to further consternation in the North and the, you know, the Lee seemed unbeatable. He had defeated McClellan, he's now defeated Pope. What could happen? Well, at this point then comes one of the more desperate efforts of the Confederacy, an invasion of the North. Why not just sit there and defeat army after army? But Lee is a very, unlike McClellan, a shrewd politician as well as a general. He's decided if we move into the north, maybe we can dislodge the border states. I'm going to take my army into Maryland. We're sending another army up into Kentucky. They, and he also was, they will rise up to greet us as liberators. We will, we will pull these border states by winning a victory in, on the border states' terrain, we will pull them into the Confederacy. We will prove to Europe that we cannot be defeated. We will affect the coming congressional elections in the North. There are the fall elections coming up for Congress. So again, there's a lot of political reasoning behind this military move. On a purely military basis, it's foolhardy. Because as we've said before, to be on the offensive is the wrong thing to be in the Civil War. You take your smaller armies where you can't stand you know, to take the losses the way the Union can because they have more manpower. You put them on the attack in Union territory. That's a very, very dangerous gamble. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The, the, this two-pronged attack is driven back. Um, the, the incursion into Kentucky does not work. Lee marches into Maryland. McClellan is hastily brought back to command the Union Army because they, 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 they're frightened that Pope can't fight. And at Antietam here, right on the border, or Sharpsville, as it's called in the Confederacy, um, right on the border between Virginia and Maryland takes place this incredibly bloody battle. As I've said, the bloodiest day in American history, uh, the Battle of Antietam. More dead than on 9-11, more dead than the Battle of the Bulge. 4,000 Americans killed on the one day, the single day, uh, September 17th, of the Battle of Antietam. Um, so this fall offensive does not work. Lee has to retreat back into Virginia, suffering casualties which really his army cannot, um, cannot afford. Lincoln is very furious that McClellan does not pursue him having won the battle, doesn't pursue Lee's army. But as I said a week or so ago, that was a myth. The, the, the victorious army is just as disorganized after one of these battles as the, victori as the defeated army. And the idea you could then follow them and wipe them out was, um, 
completely un unrealistic. But anyway, this gives Lincoln the opportunity on September 22nd, 1862, to issue what we call the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. Preliminary. It is a warning to the South. Basically, it says, if the Confederacy does not stop fighting by January 1st, 1863, I am going to declare the slaves in areas under rebellion forever free. Wonderful phrase, forever free. Um, it also reiterates his offer of compensated emancipation and colonization. The preliminary proclamation is on the edge between these two policies. He's reiterating the old policy, but warning them of the new policy general emancipation immediately, a last offer to the Confederacy to come back and keep slavery intact, which of course Lincoln knows they're not going to do at this point. But nonetheless, it is out there. This is a black and white version of a painting, the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation to the cabinet. Lincoln, among many other things, was very conscious of his own place in history and his own public image. After the final Emancipation Proclamation, he had this artist live in the White House for six months painting this painting because Lincoln wanted to be remembered as the emancipator. Now, this is a, a fanciful painting. This is not how it was, but it brings together, you've got William Seward sitting here, the Secretary of, um, of State. You've got, I guess this is Gideon Wells, the Secretary of the Navy. There's Lincoln, Salmon P. Chase, the Secretary of the Treasury is up there. Um, Stanton, I guess, this is the Secretary of War. Other cabinet members, there's Lincoln. There are nice little touches in this. There is a map on the side here, a little map showing the distribution of slave, way in that corner, the distribution of slave population in different parts of the South, a little map. And then I think one of these books, uh, they're looking at a map here, a military map. One of these books is open to the Constitution. I think this is Andrew Jackson. I'm not sure, back here in the portrait. So it's a kind of invented scene, but it's to commemorate this, this event, the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation. Chase was an, didn't like this painting. He said, why did they put Seward in the middle and not me? I'm an, man, I'm an abolitionist, et cetera, et cetera. So Seward gets pride of place, chases off on the side. 